Hey, Redeeming Grace Church family and friends, Pastor Josh here. This is the weekly update for June 6th of 2022. The first thing is that we have a church picnic after we get done tearing down next Sunday, June 12th. It'll be here at the Ministry Center, which is 140 North Street. It's one block north of the Junior Journey Museum. In fact, if you walk across the parking lot and go up the hill, you're basically looking at the uh, Ministry Center. It's on the east side of the Boy Scout building. Uh, meat will be provided to grill, so we just need you to bring sides, chips, cookies, drinks, whatever, and then bring a lawn chair, any sort of yard games that you enjoy, and I hear that there might be a kickball game that, that starts up, so uh, plan on coming next week and invite some friends if you'd like. Uh, the next thing is that uh, we, the Brown family, uh, wanting to uh, are just thinking through how we spend our summer and how we can do ministry kind of as a family now that we've got our two kids kind of settled into a good rhythm. We've gotten some home things that, uh, uh, that we needed to take care of. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to have open house Fridays. So at 6 o'clock on Fridays, anybody from the church that wants to come and hang out with us at our house, it's just an open house, just, a, just hanging out. Uh, so we can throw football, shoot some hoops, um, just hang out, play games, whatever. Uh, it'll be tacos probably every time just because that's simple for us to put together. And, uh, and so we just invite you to come anytime. We just want to be hospitable as a family. And uh, we want to open that up to our church family. We also are probably going to open that up to our neighbors. We've got 42 houses on our cul-de-sac. And we've not been super strategic. And we think this might be a way to just casually build relationships and be um, have some gospel influence on them. Uh, also, I lead the local Baptist Association of Pastors, uh, about 25 churches here in the Black Hills that... Uh, that I help, uh, help them overcome issues and help them get connected. We may invite some of those uh, pastors because some of them can get pretty lonely and ministry can be tough on families and so we may invite them as well. So uh, it's just our desire to use hospitality uh, as a way to do ministry and we would love to have you come be a part of it. Also would love to encourage you to think through how you could be hospitable where you are. I'd love to recommend a book to you. I have several copies of this so if you want a copy, I would give it to you if you promise to read it. The Simplest Way to Change the World Biblical Hospitality is a Way of Life, uh, full of really good ideas. It's not very big. It's a small book. Um, really practical. It'll stir your affections for and passions for hospitality, as well as give you all kinds of really good uh, ideas. In fact, I just randomly opened this up to once a year events, holiday parties. So it's full of great ideas. And uh, maybe hospitality could be a good uh, way to do ministry this summer. Uh, I also, not, not only would I love for us to all individually be thinking strategically about how to be hospitable with our homes, but I also would love for us to think about how to be hospitable as a church. So I uh, would love to know if some of you would like to help with some block parties here locally in this neighborhood. Um, I can't do that myself, and I would need some people who'd be willing to commit. And then once I know who's willing to commit, we could find a date that works and then try it. Uh, another thing is that we've talked about a VBS here, um, and, like at the Boys Club. And I have a contract from the Boys Club. They're willing to let us rent their facility August 1st through 4th, any one of those nights or all of those nights, uh, rent their space and do just an event like that. So I have the contract right here that if we wanted to and we had enough of you that are interested, we could do kind of a, a big kind of community kids event. Uh, we'd need to get on that pretty quickly um, and I'm willing to kind of help organize it, but, uh, but I would need probably five or six families worth of people uh, to help make sure that this is a safe, thoughtful, effective event. So. Uh, so let's take hospitality and think of it in our individual homes, and we the Browns are going to take some steps in that. I uh, would love to have you participate uh, in that, but also think through how you can do that and how we can do that as a church in this neighborhood. So uh, I think that's the emphasis that I am leaning towards as a pastor and as a just a Christian in my own life. So I would love to, uh, to just kick that out for thoughts and discussion, and if that um, brings up thoughts for you, would love to hear them. I'm going to be at the SPC annual meeting next week. I fly out Sunday morning. That was the best plane ticket I could get. So I won't be with you Sunday for the picnic or worship. Uh, you'll hear from Justin as he uh, continues our series through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but I'll be flying out to Anaheim and joining with thousands of other people to help, um, <clears throat> help make decisions about how our cooperative uh, efforts with 47,000 other churches, the largest Protestant organization in the world, the largest missionary sending or organization, the largest theological training system in the world, the largest church planting um, system in the world, um, and we get an opportunity to gather up together and to shape that cooperation and to um, and to, um, uh, to speak into it, to hear about it, and so I'm going to go steward 
uh, that responsibility on our behalf at the annual meeting. So that's where I'll be next week. And uh, what's cool about it is while it is 47,000 churches and something like 8 million members or whatever, it's the largest organization, Protestant organization in the world. It is the kind of thing that literally anyone can go up to a microphone and ask a question of anybody and, uh, and make a recommendation. In fact, last year in Nashville, it was just an ordinary member that got up and called for a sexual abuse investigation by a third party of the executive committee over the past 20 years. And that report just came out. It was kind of a big bombshell because there were really grievous um, mishandlings uh, of sexual abuse. So I'm going to go and help um, be a, a catalyst. So I guess my point being is that literally one person can go and step up to a microphone. I could do that at this meeting and, uh, and change the whole trajectory of the SBC and potentially, because of the SBC's influence in larger evangelical, change American evangelicalism. Like this one person who got up and made this recommendation to investigate the handling of sex abuse has now created this big thing that we're now dealing with, which is awful and horrible and grievous, but yet also so hopeful because so many bad people are now out of the equation. And now there's an opportunity to set an example at this meeting of how we will put an end to this kind of stuff. And that could be a signal really to all kinds of other smaller denominations of like, this is what you do when there's sin in the camp. This is what you do to correct the wrongs. This is what it looks like to repent individually, institutionally for the sins that we have committed. And I wanna be a part of that. I wanna be a part of, of, of the good that that is. And uh, it's cool that we get to be a part of that kind of thing. So while it's grievous and heavy and unacceptable, the things that have happened at the same time, uh, there is an opportunity to go and make a real, 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 real difference. And uh, I want to do my best to do that. So I'm going to be booked up from like 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. basically the whole time that I'm there uh, just because I want to hear as much information as possible and then to influence in whatever way that I can the things that I can. So I'm going to try to maximize that investment because it's not cheap to go out there. And so I want to maximize um, the ability to uh, to steward our responsibility to make sure that this cooperative fellowship is something that we can have confidence in and there's real questions about that and I want to work for that. It also, this whole sexual abuse task force and its findings, um, certainly the first inclination is to think through how to correct this institutionally because that's what the investigation was about. But I think that we would be remiss to not also take it as an opportunity to hold a mirror up to ourselves and think through, are we a safe place for people, for kids, for women, uh, for those who are vulnerable. Um, that's why we need to be really vigilant about our policies and procedures to make sure that we are never allowing any sort of uh, abuse to happen under our watch. Uh, as much as it depends on us, we need to be very vigilant in making sure that it's only members who are accountable, who are background checked, who are trained, and following the procedures can work with kids and minors. And then I also want us to make sure that we're always a place that, uh, that, that things can be brought to light. So if something has happened to you, um, either at our church or some other church, we, uh, I, I would hope that we could become a place that you could say something, that there would be someone, whether that's too intimidating to come to a male pastor about that, I understand, but that there would be someone in the congregation that you would be able to go to and uh, would bring that to the light, and that we would live up to our name of being redeeming grace, a place of healing. Often churches are really hard places to bring up abuse and trauma, and I don't want our church to be that. So. I'm going to try to make efforts to make sure that we as a church are a place that's, uh, that's trauma-informed and handles these things well, uh, that cares well for victims, believes them, doesn't add to their trauma, that has zero tolerance for those who have been offenders, and, uh, and that we do the right thing every time. I deeply grieve even one child or one woman that has been mistreated is one too many, and, um, and not only do we need to prevent that with good policies and procedures, that's really important, but let's not stop there because there are people in our congregation who have been traumatized. And uh, I don't want to overlook that. I don't want to just prevent. I want us to be a place of healing. And so um, so I, I want us to work together because this is not just a pastor thing. This needs to be a culture thing. So if there are some of you that would be willing to get trained in how to handle these kinds of issues, if maybe you already have some training that would be helpful for us as a church to become a safer place uh, for those things to be brought up and dealt with, um, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff, but I, I do want to pastor well, and I want our church to be a place where we have really um, skilled, um, thoughtful, gracious, um, strong people that, uh, that can help those that are hurting and uh, help us walk through a healing process. So, um, so I don't want to just make this just about the SBC. That's not the big thing. For me, it's the individual image bearers who've been wounded by people 
and have not had a chance to be heard. And uh, I think that needs to start at the local church level. That needs to start at the individual level. And I just want to grow in that way. I don't know all the answers, um, uh, but, uh, but I do want us to be that kind of place. And so if some of you have a heart for that or you have some history with this, um, I would love to have a conversation with you and for us to work strategically to be a very effective church in handling uh, the things that have happened to people. So um, I'll just leave it there. I was going to make a comment about uh, eldership, but I'll leave that for the next uh, video. We've got some time on that uh, to sort of explain how eldership, uh, how we're going through the process and some tweaks I want to make to the process of bringing on elders over the course of the next few months. But, uh, but I'll save that for another video. This one's long enough. And I uh, really want to end with that emphasis of um, not just raging against the mishandling that other people uh, have done, but for us to look in the mirror and go, what are some things that we could do better to care for those that have been hurt? And, um, and there's obviously, I think, um, obviously is maybe the wrong word. Um, if the if the reports are true, there is more trauma in our congregation. There's more people who are hurting in our community than maybe we even know of. And let's make sure that we're creating an environment and sending the kind of signals that we care, that we'll handle these things rightly, that we won't shame, that we won't add to the trauma. And we will uh, be a place that really is full of, of redeeming grace. And uh, and that's that's really the heart here. So thanks for taking uh, a few minutes to uh, to listen to this video. It's a few minutes longer than I'd hoped, but I did want to share my heart, and that takes uh, some time for me to form the sentences and to try to communicate uh, the significance of what's going on right now, not just at the national level of our denomination, but individually at the local level, and, uh, and where we want to go from here and what we want to learn. So pray for us, and if you have input in ways that we could be better in terms of how we handle those who've been hurt. Um, I definitely need your help and we need this to be a culture of our church and not just a uh, initiative when something bad happens in the news. So, all right, I love you. Uh, would love to see you on Friday. Uh, I uh, won't see you probably at all next week, uh, but, uh, but you can always call or text and I'd love to pray for you, talk to you about anything at any time. So God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.